the importance of understanding history was helpful to me. That's why, as a pastor, you know, it's not necessarily my job to set communion policy. But you know, how are we going? Are we going to do communion in cars? Are we going to, you know, put up a little, you know, breakaway packets or whatever, like we use for the military and so on and so forth? Or how are we going to do communion? Just sort of bless it through the TV or whatever, which is the most bizarre concept I've ever seen. Um, you know, taking a key to history, we're just not going to do communion for a while <laughs> until the situation gets to where we can meet publicly for worship again, because that is how uh, the Lutheran Church 400, 300, 200 years ago handled these circumstances, and not only something like play um, moving through town, but like siege, for example. We've, we have instructions on how to minister during the siege of your town. You know, that was another time communion and church services were temporarily halted because it's kind of hard to have a church service when artillery is raining down on your head, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it just doesn't work too well. Um, and, you know, you have all of the horrors of siege warfare. I'm not even going to go into that in class because it's wicked and ridiculous. Um, and how do ministers function during those times? And so seeing that gave me some kind of guidance to be able to say, okay, we're going to do this, we're not going to do that, we'll try it this way, or well, whatever type of thing. I felt like I had a road map. I wonder if we ought to be thinking the same way about the Lutheran Confessions as a road map. I mean, how did these guys get to this stuff? And what was important? Um, and how does that affect us in the future when there are a lot of tensions trying to pull us off course, trying to get us to compromise our faith? Because people actually bled and died over this stuff that's written here, this um, silly little document or whatever I called it a few minutes ago. I mean, people actually literally stuck their necks out for this. When this was first presented in Augsburg, there was a, sort of like a meeting. Emperor Charles, with all of his little ping and all of his princes, they had like a pre, you know, like a pre-meeting meeting that evening. And he's saying, "Hey guys, this is what how it's going to go tomorrow. This is what we want. You got any questions, sort of thing? We're kind of hoping you redact this thing." And one of these guys, I can't remember his name, got down on his knees. He literally bared his throat. He said, "I'd rather have my throat slit right now than give up the gospel of Jesus Christ." And it shocked it just shocked Emperor Charles. Like, no, 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 no. Oh, no throats, no, we're not going, no, we're not going there type of thing. He, he backpedaled furiously because this guy literally bore his neck to him and said, cut it down because I'm not giving up Jesus Christ. So you think I might ought to be able to find a way to teach this effectively, just at least have a passing reference there, you see what I'm saying? Uh, just to know that this is where people have been. And I would also submit that these things have been abused, too. Like I say, you don't want to read these devotionally. I mean, they're, they're you know, Midwestern Lutherans who are going to watch your video <coughs> and try to get me excommunicated from the church from saying that, but you don't want to treat this like the bronze serpent on a pole. You know what happened there. Everybody's getting bit by snakes because they're off complaining about God. A bunch of people die. Moral of the story, don't complain about God, you might die. You know, sort of thing. Moses says, here's your bronze, make a bronze serpent, lift it up on a pole, you look at that snake, and you live. See how he's trying to make it like, trying to make it like the cross of Christ. This is how faith happens. You look to Jesus, and you live. You know, you don't have to make any extra sacrifices. You don't have to figure it out. You say, how is this rational? We got this stupid bronze snake on a pole. I'm going to look at it, and okay, fine. But that's the way God wanted it done. At least trying to illustrate a point. Well, you know what happens? At some point in the future, they decide to start worshiping the stupid bronze snake. And that's not what we want to be doing. You could even make the case that we sometimes do that with crosses today, you know, or whatever. Or, you know, I'm a Lutheran Christian. That's, that was never the point of it. And so to me, these things are tools in the toolbox as we move forward including our history, in trying to bring the gospel to this current generation that obviously needs it, that every generation does, but the thing about being in the electronic world is um, I think stupid ideas travel much faster than they used to in the ancient world. And so people, you know, all the things I've preached about today, people being anxious, people, you know, whatever, having these responses, they can happen that much quicker because we can write a meme in Beijing and stick it on Instagram over here and you know set the Americans on fire to do whatever or whatever the case may be. We are in a ridiculous information war now, and how should we respond as Christians? 
Remember that we were called to peace. So perhaps this can be, uh, this can be a document for helping with that.